We've got a new radionuclide, productinium, specifically productinium-231. The whole thing remains in a lead container because this is really nasty stuff. I'll explain why with the gamma spectrum in a moment. The packaging indicates that it contains about 5 mg of protactinium oxide, Pa205, with an activity of 9.5 MB. I can't verify this directly, but initial dose rate measurements show that there is a substantial activity inside with about 108 microsieverts through approximately 2 cm of lead. I'm getting around 3500 counts per second. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? Where does productinium-231 come from? Let's start with the origin from ore to the finished product and then we can talk about the decay data of course. Productinium-231 is a naturally occurring isotope. We know productinium-234M from the uranium radium series, but that's a topic for another video. Productinium-231 appears in the uranium actinium series. Realistically, you can only get it from enriched materials with a high uranium-235 content. Now let's dive into the awesome story where 99% of all productinium-231 comes from in the labs worldwide. It all stems from a really cool project that took place in 1961. I'll delve into it in more detail right now. The goal was to finally have a large stockpile of productinium-231. To achieve this, 59.5 tons of sludge, in this case spent nuclear fuel, were processed. This is done in hot cells. But first they practice on smaller scales, without hot cells. How small? 7.5 kilograms of radioactive sludge, which was reduced to 16 liters after leaching. It's quite small indeed, right? There were several methods, four of them which sounded promising. Two of them involved dissolving uranium and leaving productinium behind. The two other involved leaching both and then separating the uranium. It was decided to dissolve the uranium, then follow productinium processing methods. The Jackson method seemed unusable because productinium was lost pretty much everywhere. For example, it didn't stick to the second ion exchange column. In general, it wasn't suitable for larger quantities because you would need 600 liters of hydrochloric hydrofluoric acid for the setup, no thanks. The process devised by Maddox looked something more like this. Lots of nitric acid, lots of hydrochloric acid and some hydrofluoric acid, some TBP and ion exchanger. To illustrate how complex it was, let's take a look at table number two and see things like storing times of two days. And do you know where we are in this scheme right now? Here. But now we know it takes 400 milliliters of eight normal nitric acid and 48 hours of storing to leach out 97% of the productinium. Just as an FYI, leaching describes the process of dissolving substances from a solid using a solvent. They try to skip this solvent extraction and pass it directly through the ion exchanger but unfortunately it didn't work. So back to solvent extraction. Now that they had productinium in HCl and nitric acid, what's next? Well there's a lot of other stuff here too. For example radioactive zirconium 95 because they were still working with spent nuclear fuel. Productinium was extracted with DIBK diisobutyl ketone. Now the goal was to get the productinium out of the DIBK. Normally it would involve 8 normal hydrochloric acid and 0.1 normal hydrofluoric acid. Shake it and then separate the phases by pouring one out. But this shaking caused a mystery solid to form. So they had to get creative. A productinium containing DIBK solution was dripped into a column with glass helixes and then the HCl-HF solution was allowed to drip through that. Thus the DIBK was the stationary phase and the phase contact was achieved through the glass spirals. Zirconium could then be better removed by using aluminium trichloride. Rinse and repeat for three cycles and this allowed him to recover 80 to 90% of the protactinium from this radioactive sludge. And then they moved on to larger quantities. 59.5 tons of radioactive sludge with 172 grams of productinium and 11.65 tons of uranium. Ultimately between 108 grams and 126 grams of productinium-231 could be obtained depending on the measurement methods. I intentionally left out some details because there was quite a bit of trial and error and the different acid concentration were tested for some steps. But that's the story on how most of the world's productinium-231 supply was produced. I will link the original paper in the video description. Now onto the decay data. 
Half-Life 32,570 years. Decay mode, alpha decay or spontaneous fission with a probability of less than 3 times 10 to the power of minus 10%. It decays into actinium-227. Specific activity is 1.7 gigabecquerels per gram. Now let's take a look at the gamma spectrum. We basically see the entire decay chain. Normally with chemically processed uranium and thorium chemicals, there is always a long-lived radionuclide between uranium and radon. This means that most uranium chemicals do not produce radon, as reaching the radioactive equilibrium takes thousands of years to re-establish. This sample is over 60 years old, so a significant amount has formed and then it quickly decays to the end of the decay chain. Here are the half-lives for each step. This means this sample emanates, releasing radon, which is a gaseous alpha emitter that spreads radioactivity pretty much everywhere. Ugh, ugly. If we had an alpha spectrum, we would primarily see the three alpha energies, 5013 kiloelectron volts, 4951 kiloelectron volts and 5028 kiloelectron volts. The gamma lines you see come from the fifth most frequent alpha energy of 4734 kiloelectron volts. This excited actinium-227 nucleus is energetically high enough that the isomeric transition into the ground state does not lie within the 0 to 60 kiloelectron volt range. This is quite a complex topic today. And one last piece of information, productinium-231 is extremely radiotoxic. Anyone who has watched this far might have heard about the toxicity of polonium-210. The whole body dose coefficient for polonium-210 ranges between 6.1 times 10 to the power of minus 7 and 3.3 times 10 to the power of minus 6 zverts per becquerel depending on the compound for inhalation and 1.2 times 10 to the power of minus 6 zverts for ingestion. One zvert of radiation dose is in the order of magnitude that brings severe health consequences. 10 zverts is nearly certain death. For protactinium-231 the coefficient is 3.4 times 10 to the power of minus 5 zverts per becquerel to 1.4 times 10 to the power of minus 4 zverts per becquerel, depending on the compound for inhalation. For ingestion it is 7.1 times 10 to the power of minus 7 zverts per becquerel, so it's 10 to 100 times more radiotoxic than polonium. This is really toxic. Take these values with a grain of salt, they come from sources from 1989. As I said, it depends on the compound and other factors. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.